Okay. Okay. All right. Hello. Can everyone hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, hooray. Thank you so much for joining. This is the very first time I've done this. So if I accidentally lose all of you, I'm very sorry. Um, hopefully I don't press a button that I'm not supposed to press. Um, let me just get the right screen happening and I'll get my session up. Share screen. Thank you all so much. I know it's very late over there in different parts of the world where you all are. Uh, I myself at 6pm here in Australia on Saturday. So I'm well awake. Uh, share screen. Oops. All good? Can we see it? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. As I said, my name is Tilka and I'm from Australia, country Victoria to be exact. I um, was invited to join Ed Change Global by the very lovely Bloodcut, and I've had the honour of meeting a few of you via emails and um, via all sorts of social correspondence. And I'm very excited to be here. But as I said, if I accidentally um, close the screen or lose you, I'm very sorry. You can email me and I will share information that way, in the old school way. Um, so my presentation or my session is um, called For the Love of Languages. I'm very passionate about uh, additional language education, which here in Australia is quite a challenge because we have the monolingual mindset here. Um, so I'm a bit of a one horse warrior, so to speak. I'm, I'm out there trying to make a difference for, particularly in primary schools, for children learning um, additional languages in primary schools. So the, the purpose of my work, I suppose, and why I want to share this with all of you is I believe that all children, irrespective of their um, backgrounds or their languages, deserve to learn another language. And I think that um, just by listening to Vlog Concession as well, I've been completely inspired and empowered um, by, by what some teachers out there are doing. It's, it's fantastic, but we need more people doing things to change the way that, um, that languages are taught and education, which is, I guess, why we're all here. So let me get cracking on this. All right, so by the end of this session, it is my hope or my aim that you will have lots of um, toolbox ideas and what I call heartful teaching practices for you to implement into your own classrooms, whatever, whatever classroom that may be. Um, and yeah, for any age group. So these are just some ideas and just some things that I've picked up along the way with my teaching. Um, which hopefully you'll find useful. So about five ideas is normally um, about the amount that I request my teachers or my audience members to record, um, to share at the end of what they would like to try, um, as in activities or lesson ideas that they would like to try in their own classrooms. I'm very big, um, and I'll explain why in a moment, but I'm, I'm very passionate about teaching children explicitly social and emotional emotional intelligences. Um, I don't believe enough is done, at least from my experience and what I've seen in classrooms um, that I've been to. And I think that there's definitely room for improvement in the way that it can be done um, better for the sake of all of our kids everywhere. All right, first thing, normally, that I, thing that I'll normally get teachers to do is to write down or at least think it's different in this format because I don't have pieces of paper to pass around the room um, write down what it is that you love or think about what you love about being a teacher and as you're just thinking of those things I'll explain why I do this um, sometimes as we all know it can be stressful and challenging at times in this job as a, as a teacher it is the most rewarding profession but there are days when we question, you know, the extra yard duty or the reports or the, the heartbreaking situations that we see some children in. And sometimes it's really hard to remember why we're doing this job. Um, so I always ask my teachers to write down a few ideas, um, a few of their own thoughts. This is, this is for your own self-reflection, by the way. A few reminders about why um, you're doing what you're doing and why you love to be a teacher. And then with this piece of paper, I ask that teachers keep this somewhere private, if they wish, somewhere that they can see it every day. Normally on the bathroom mirror is a good spot, but somewhere that it can be moved around as well because if it's kept in the same place in your house for instance it just becomes part of 
part of uh, the furniture and you don't pay attention anymore to it anymore. So by moving it around, particularly if you look at it before night time and then you wake up again in the morning and you read it again, it just reiterates the positivity um, and your positive influence that you have for your students and why you're doing this job, why you're getting up every day for these, for these amazing kids. So that's just something I like to do for all of you. Okay, and that's what I was just um, talking about. But this can actually be turned into an activity for students as well, usually at the beginning of the school year. Um, obviously, you're not going to be collecting these. These are not for you to collect as a piece of work from your students. But just asking them to do this task, some kids find this really challenging. And your observation, standing back and watching the children complete this task, you can see straight away which students have high self-esteem, which students really have trouble writing down the things that they love about themselves. And then you can then um, follow those students and, and develop sessions with them to help boost their self-esteem in any language, in any class, in any subject. All right, so just to give you a bit of background, um, I feel that it's important that I explain that I am first and foremost a primary school classroom teacher, and I've been teaching for many, many years now. And how I came onto this journey of the language toolbox was after implementing our school's very first CLIL unit. And CLIL, for those of you who don't know, sorry if I'm preaching to the converted, but CLIL is Content Language Integrated Learning. And at the time, in 2014, my students, in, I was teaching grade three, four, so the kids were 10 or 11 years old, and we were learning Italian at my primary school. But it wasn't, it wasn't done properly, and the kids were having six or seven years in primary school and not leaving with very much knowledge at all in learning Italian. So I was sent away, I put my hand up and I was accepted into a um, leading languages course in Melbourne. And I became the school's representation, I suppose, for boosting the language program in our school. And as part of that program, as part of that course, I was um, required to implement a CLIL unit or a CLIL lesson. But I got so passionate and so carried away with this that I um, had the full support of my language, sorry, of my school leaders. And we implemented um, Tuscan bean soup. So I had 12 teachers, including the Italian teacher and, and teaching aides as well, and 103 students all doing this same unit over four weeks. And I, at the time, I didn't know any Italian, none, but obviously I was working very closely with the Italian teacher. And the whole experience was so beneficial for all the students involved and the teachers that I just thought, why aren't other teachers doing this? Why, why is this such a secret? You know, CLIL, I mean, for those of you who are in Europe, CLIL isn't new. It hasn't, um, you know, it's, it's, it's fairly new to Australia, but like I mentioned before, we have this mono, monolingual mindset. So um, trying anything new, especially when it comes to additional languages is, is a challenge and it's something that my colleagues at, at the school at the time were fairly reluctant to do and to get involved but I think I won them over with my passion and my excitement for doing this. So not long after that unit, even that was an, an amazing success, I actually decided to leave my school and leave my beautiful class of kids um, and at the same time I moved, um, I was involved in the About Taste project which was a sister school project with um, four schools in Italy and four schools in Victoria and there was a problem with the communications breakdown between all of the schools and it was becoming an issue because we were about to present our work at Milano Expo in, um, in, in Italy in 2015. So I decided someone had to go to Italy and work with the teachers there to share back with the people here in um, Victoria, my colleagues in Victoria. Long story Sure. The CLIL experience and my experience of um, working with the teachers in Italy, I had this epiphany of, right, this is, this is how languages are going to be changed. The teaching of languages are going to be changed. They need to be changed because the way it has been taught for so long hasn't been working. Um, and I've become known to students everywhere as Tilkabel, the travelling teacher, and that's a whole other story I won't go into now. But it um, really 
it really, um, my, my passion really grew from those two experiences. So I've been back in Australia since 2015, um, but back and forward and all over the world since then. Um, that's just a quick, quick guideline of where I've been in the past four years, um, mainly Italy and working with children and their teachers over there, but all around the place, Finland, Dubai, Japan, um, New Zealand. Uh, I even had a stint of working with teachers and their students in Northern Territory in a very, very remote school where they speak 10 different um, languages, 10 different dialects. Um, it's indigenous languages up there. So that was, that was really interesting. Um, that was actually quite a challenge and not just because of the crocodiles. Um, but with all of these schools and all of the kids that I've met everywhere and all of my travels and teaching, this, this one theme is, um, has been consistent throughout is that children cannot learn unless at first they feel happy. Now that might, might seem really obvious, but it, for me, it just really hit home. Um, particularly more recently, I have just completed a six month position at one of my local country schools. And it's a school that was in, that's in a very low socioeconomic area. And I was employed as initially to be the Japanese teacher. And I was working with the other teachers there to be their curriculum leader. But it became apparent pretty early on that there was a bigger need for these children to learn how to love who they are and love their um, selves and develop stronger levels of self-esteem um, and confidence. And that had such a profound impact upon me. And this is a sample of one of the lessons that I taught, um, an ex a, a very explicit lesson on why do we need to learn another language. And that quote there is from a grade four boy. Um, he wrote, so you know people are not bad. And that's, that just goes to show that he um, has quite a sad home life, but he's trying to explain that obviously if you can speak to other people in other languages, then you know that, that they're okay. Um, anyway, the, the point of me sharing all of that in my teaching background with you is to, I suppose, explain that I am, yes, a Japanese teacher, but first and foremost classroom. So I've seen and worked with hundreds and hundreds of children. So I, I know I've got a pretty good understanding of, of the importance of, um, of teaching to their hearts. <clears throat> And those kids that I was just talking about at that last school where I was there, um, a lot of those children didn't have the basic needs of food and having enough food to eat, water, warmth and rest. They lived very unstable lives. Um, so the other things, the other needs are higher on, on Maslow's hierarchy um, of needs is just wasn't happening for them because their basics weren't there. All right, now I'm going to be really clever and I'm going to try and just switch screens to show you this link. Hang on. Ah. Oh, I can't do it. Hang on. Oh no. Silka, what if you click on the link? Yeah. In the clip, you mean? Ah, yeah. no, there it is. Got it. Got it. There it is. Oh. Fingers crossed. 98 million six hundred thousand dollars. Hang Good on. day. Can you imagine making that much money? Value. Okay. Before, can you still hear me? Yes, we can, but we can't see the, the video clip. Oh. No. Value. No, we are seeing the your first slide. Okay. Do you need? All right, well, what's going on? 
Uh, I was just trying to be clever and I was trying to show that YouTube clip, but it's not happening. Did you hear that? Yeah. Hang on. It's all right. I might have to just scrap it. Ah. Okay. I'm back again. All right. Um, anyway, this this man, Jack Ma, he um, was talking at the beginning of this year, the World Economic Forum, um, and he was talking about how, basically, if you haven't seen this clip already, it's definitely worth having a look at. I was trying to be clever and trying to link, link you into it now, but it doesn't matter. It wasn't working. Um, but he was talking about the need to um, change the way we teach because... The way that we, he, his argument was that the way that we've been teaching has been the same for 200 years and that the way that we teach the children now needs to be something different, something unique, because if you think about the way that technology is advancing, his argument was that if we leave too much to the world of technology, then the children won't learn the values of social and emotional skills, um, which was the... These, these sorts of skills that he was talking about. So developing compassion and empathy, persistence, encouragement, respect, independent thinking for children to be able to think for themselves, um, self-confidence to develop high levels of self-confidence, appreciation and acceptance of diversity, teamwork and communication. Now, all of those skills, I believe, are developed and enhanced through learning, teaching and learning of another language. And these are the sorts of skills that I saw when my students were back in 2014 when they were completing the CLIL unit. And one little boy in particular, he, um, he was one of my lower literacy students. And so whenever it was time to, for our English literacy lessons in class, it's separate from Italian, he would roll around on the floor. He would annoy the other kids. He'd just be so disengaged and... He was, he was lower academically, um, but when we came to do this school unit, he was so switched on, focused and engaged because he saw the purpose for learning the Italian um, in order for us to, to read the recipe in Italian and then go into the kitchen and cook, and cook the soup, the Tuscan bean soup. So for him, for that one child in particular, his levels of self-confidence just absolutely skyrocketed and he was able to communicate and collaborate with his peers um, with confidence. And that for me was perhaps my one um, shining light from the whole thing was to see that change in that, that boy. <clears throat> and I was just wondering if how, how if you teach... Um, additional uh, if you teach an additional language how do you incorporate emotional and social skills into your classrooms uh, just listening to like her before about the wonderful work that she does and I've had the honor of sharing it firsthand seeing it firsthand um, I was just wondering if anyone out there wanted to share any of these skills that they teach in their classrooms we can come back Um, for us here in Australia, particularly in Victoria, a lot of the teachers here, classroom teachers, are so pushed to the limits with the curriculum that we have to get through and often, sadly, the skills that we know that kids need, the social and emotional skills, are pushed aside because they're not deemed measurable and the, um, although we know they're important. We know that they help the kids in our classrooms to be able to do those things. The programs are fantastic, but they're often pushed aside. And therefore my argument is that these, these sorts of programs and these skills can be incorporated into additional language classes. So the very, the very point of learning another language um, is enhancing all of those skills that I was just talking about before. The, the, um, 
understanding of diversity, the confidence that they gain from learning another language, persisting, learning to be persistent with something even when it's too hard, all of those skills are enhanced when they're learning another language. But often the problem is we don't know how. We don't know how to implement them into our Italian classes. How do we incorporate emotional intelligence skills into um, our Japanese classes? How do we get through all of the curriculum that we have to get through to teach another language, let alone the social and emotional skills? Surely that should be left to the classroom teacher or to another teacher. Well, no, I, I believe that we can all, we're all teaching the same kids. We can all contri contribute something and whilst we may not be able to get to every single child every single session, because often the language classes are turned through over and over and over um, and quickly, the kids are leaving and coming back and forward quickly. But you don't know the impact that you have on at least one child. It may be as simple as standing at the door when they're coming into your room and giving them a high five or noticing, hey, I like your, I like your new hairstyle, it really suits you. And for that one child, that one kid, you, you might have turned their whole day around and you just, you don't know the impact you have um, of a kind word that you have upon those kids. It's so important. And leading through example so teaching um, and, and acting in a way that kids can see how you're being judged all day long as a teacher as we know and if they're watching you um, behave in such a way it's obviously imparting more skills onto them if they can see you as a positive role model all right so i keep talking about this social and emotional learning um, this is something that i have done a bit, bit of reading about and this book is one of my new favorite books. It's from um, Daniel Goleman, Emotional Intelligence. There's so much stuff online. And a lot of what I'm talking about is, um, it comes naturally, it's common sense to me. But I, I take that from having done many years of teaching lots of children in different settings. But um, if, if you're not really sure what I'm talking about, I've broken it down to these four sections based upon that website there, Daniel Goleman's website. And basically, emotional intelligence is a, an umbrella term for um, those four competencies, self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, and relationship management. Um, the first two are obviously personal competencies. It's focus on self, so self-awareness and self-management. And the other two competencies um, involve other people, so focus on others. And focusing on those personal competencies, the self-awareness and self-management are really um, skills, I suppose. They, they are really um, characteristics of, of yourself. So if you have a high level of self-confidence and you are aware of your own emotional state, you are going to be able to um, identify that within other people as well. So you are able to read them as well but you need to be able to get this right first. And this is what kids need first. They need to be able to understand their own awareness, their own emotions, their own feelings, their own um, ideas first. And one way that um, I do this and that I've been teaching to other teachers is as simple as taking the attendance list or marking the role in the morning, they come into your class. So, this doesn't happen straight away, it takes time, you've got to train them into doing this and, and create an environment in which they feel safe to respond in such a manner. But over time, you can get your students to answer instead of saying, yes, I'm here, or whatever language you teach, hi, here, um, see, see, I'm here. Um, get them to respond with a number from one to ten based upon how they are feeling and just from listening to the role the whole class gains an understanding of um, how each student within their class is feeling their peers without that child having to say or explain anything else and this works for any age group particularly um, teenagers as well because they don't necessarily like to be to expressive at times, they, they like to keep a lot to themselves. But if one of your students is normally around a seven and they come to school one day and they say that they're about a four, then they're going to be um, one that you would need to watch and that you would need to keep an eye on. Um, and it sends a message to the rest of the class that they are not feeling as happy as they normally would be. 
So that's really easy. And that doesn't take any extra preparation in terms of preparing for that class. It's just something that you start doing. This is another fantastic, really easy thing to do in any classroom. And again, it doesn't need to be something that you spend ages and ages and ages on, really quick um, um, display that you can make, or it can be worked on over time. But it can be something that you keep up in your room so that it is there for students to look at. And this is, the point of this is to have a display that enhances um, words beyond feeling happy and sad. If children are able to explain and, ex and express their emotions beyond feeling happy, um, can go into more details, it gives a different level of um, feelings and different emotions that they can explain to their peers or to you. Um, really, really effective. This, these were from two Italian classrooms, um, the one on the top right of the red, a little bit hard to read, um, that was from a secondary school and the other was from a primary school. Or, um, elementary school, elementare. I'll just leave that you, there for you to read. It's something that I came across fairly recently. <clears throat> but it reiterates the power of words and the impact that your thoughts and therefore your words have on your body and your emotion and the way that you move through life. This is another really great activity suitable for any age group um, and any language, but it gives you a really, really great uh, awareness of how that child is on the inside. So they're likes and dislikes, for instance, instead of saying, I like pizza, I like chocolate, whatever, they can actually draw that and illustrate that. And something magical happens when children are able to just draw and not have to, um, not have to explain in detail because children, I, at least I've found, have much more confidence in drawing rather than writing because they're afraid of making a mistake. That's something you can work on over time. But to begin with, this was a grade four student, so she was 10. Um, it's just a self-introduction, Matoshi no Namae wa Sky desu, so my name is Sky in Japanese. On one side, you've got what the world sees of her, what she looks like to the outside. And the other side is what she looks like on the inside. So the things that she loves, her passions, her dreams, her hopes, those things are, um, ideas that you can be using to incorporate into future lessons. And if you've got a whole class of, of posters like this, then you can tailor your lessons and your classes to really um, match in with those children's feelings and what they really love. And then for them, they know straight away, oh, she remembered, she remembered that I love um, riding horses or she remembered that I love music. And a really powerful and effective way to really tap into their, um, their selves and their learning. This is a really popular one. I've done this a lot. I've done this with teachers um, and I, I do it often with students, particularly on Glitter Fridays. It's a independent task, so it's not something that I collect. It's not something that I correct. It is the pure purpose of this is for the student to hold on to this, to identify um, things about themselves that they love. So similar to what I had done at the start with you, with the big heart with the teachers, this is, um, you can extend it for, for more advanced students or um, bring it down a notch for the students who are still learning. But in any language, it, this works. So they write down their name, they choose their favourite colour paper, they write down their name, they can decorate it however they wish, and they write down what they love about themselves. And over time, this activity can be repeated as their language and their vocabulary skills increase, but also their levels of self-esteem and self-confidence increase. So for instance, I might do this at the start of a school year and revisit it again come term three, so three terms later. Um, and then you can see, or they can see rather, the, the difference in their growth of self-esteem and in their language. 
And this is not something I keep. This is not something I put on display in my classroom. This is purely for the students. I ask that they take these home and does, they don't even need to show their parents. Um, this is not for anyone else but for them. And they display this on their wall or somewhere nearby their bed. And the same principle that I was explaining before. They read it before they go to sleep and then they read it as soon as they wake up. And in that way, they're training their mind to think positively about themselves. And it's a good reminder. And in that way, their um, the neural pathways or the way that they think about themselves in their brain changes. And they're starting the day on a with a positive thought and they're ending their day with a positive thought about themselves. And this is something I've done, um, this was last year with three classes of students of third grade, I think they were, classes in Italy. And this, I was a visiting um, teacher there working with their English teachers. And for these kids, they had never done anything like this before. And they all by this stage thought I was a mad, the mad woman from Australia, the crazy woman from Australia, who comes in and moves the tables around and gives us coloured paper and puts sprinkles everywhere. But they will never forget this lesson because this was something so removed, so far removed from a textbook, from um, anything, any other way that they've learned English. So for them, they've got something real, it's colourful, it was engaging, and, but they were also learning the words beyond um, I feel um, good. So they were learning the context. I was at that school for a week, so I had, I had time to work with all of those beautiful kids. And then we move to the social competencies. Um, by the way, these are just really quick lessons that I'm zipping through because I'm just conscious of the time and I'm normally used to working with a room full of people, not through a screen. Um, but the personal competencies need to be um, taught first and built upon first before we can expect children to work well with other people. They need to be able to understand who they are within themselves. So the social skills can, must come after you've developed the um, personal skills and, and working over time. So these are the um, competencies that focus on the um, awareness of others and looking at being aware of how other people and other students um, are feeling and what to do about that. So for instance, like I was saying before, when you're marking the role with kids who come to school and they're saying that they're on a, their number is two for that day, um, you are teaching the students, okay, well then that student isn't feeling really great today, I wonder why, maybe I'll go up and ask them a bit later on what the problem is or if there's anything I can do to help. And often, you know, that's just enough, just to know that someone else cares about them to, to want to ask if there's anything they can do. All right, this is a bit of a self-reflection um, um, for you. Uh, this is on the left is a school in Italy, an English class, and on the right is the same class after I came in. And I know that there's different regulations in schools about how furniture should be arranged, but I just can't help but wonder why do language classes occur if children are sitting separately and students are sitting separately like that. Surely communication can only be enhanced if the children are working together in a group. Um, so I come in and upset the apple cart often when I'm visiting these schools and move the furniture around and get them to work um, with each other in groups and talking and that in English because I'm there as the English teacher um, to get them working together and developing their levels of confidence. They're, they're much more um, willing to have a go at speaking in another language if they've got their little group together. And it's not so intimidating as opposed to standing up in front of a whole class and getting a question wrong. If they're in a little group, it doesn't matter so much to them. It's, it's more real. Goodness, if you haven't seen this, I'm not going to show it now, um, mainly because my link didn't work before, but this is a really um, quite bleak look at Moby's perception of how he perceives the world to be. Um, have a look at it if you get the chance. But basically, the reason why I'm in wanting to do all of these, these things with the language toolbox and building up these social skills is so our students don't become like this. 
Um, and it's scary sometimes to see young kids in primary school, mainly that I work with, are so used to just communicating through a screen. They're forgetting how to talk to each other. Oh, it's frozen. Okay. Um, this next lesson idea, you've got, I've got all of the circles ticked, ticked there. So this cultural clarity lesson is a, a very explicit lesson to explain why are we learning another language? Why, why do we need to learn another language? We speak English here in Australia. Um, and it's been interesting conducting this session with many groups of kids. And some of the answers they give me are quite shocking. But I usually have this um, conduct this lesson when I've, I've played the YouTube clip. Um, whether you like him or dislike him, either way, this particular YouTube clip from Michael Jackson's performance at the Super Bowl in 1993 um, has a lot of children dressed up in different costumes, their national costumes, national dress, all coming together for this performance. But the point of it being that I, I share this with students um, so that they can see other kids from all around the world in different costumes. And we often, I then pose the question, well, I wonder how they all communicate because they all speak a different language. So just getting the students aware of why it is important to learn another language just through a clip like that and sharing their ideas. Um, it's it's really quite amazing, quite powerful. <clears throat> okay, my screen stopped. Hang on. Oh, this activity is fantastic. Um, snowball, and it can can be done with anything, any topic rather. I use it for teaching compliments, how to give students compliments. I did this with a group of teachers um, just recently, a group of secondary teachers in New Zealand. Um, and I wasn't sure how they were going to respond to this, but it worked, so few. Um, but what it is, is you get the whole class standing up. They've written their name on a piece of paper and you've taught them prior to them writing this down actually what a compliment is how do we give a good compliment blah 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 what all of that looks like it's a whole lesson you can extend this into a whole lesson and then they all stand up around the room scrunch up their piece of paper and then when i've got my little bell i ring it and they throw the paper and they just keep throwing the paper all around the room until they've picked up one and then i've rung the bell and then they go and write a comment on it and it's anonymous and it's secret but they can um, write a compliment about that person and then scrunch it back up, up, up again ready to do the same activity again so we all wait until we've all written something nice about that person and then we scrunch it up and i ring my bell and we do it again three to five times is usually enough we've had enough of things being thrown around the room by then um and at the end of that i gather all of the paper and i sit them all down and i check the paper and i will be reading the um the papers in front of me so right jackson would you like me to read out your compliments uh, in front of everybody and usually the first few students say oh no because they're too shy but after a while they say oh okay and i'll read out what people have said about that student in front of the whole class and it just boosts the whole room and this is something that can be done in in any language um if you've taught if you've taught them the skills and again you just tailor it modify it according to their um their needs and their understandings and their levels but it is so powerful because it's anonymous and it's a bit of fun and you get to throw paper around the room my goodness what teacher lets people throw things around the room but it it works and again it's something that the kids can take home and think oh someone thinks this about me in my class you know i i am special and you don't know that that one activity which can take up from 10 minutes or 20 minutes however long you want to do it but that could just be the one thing that gets that kid through that day you know they might have an awful awful home life you don't know what's going on but it's it's really lifted them and reminded them that there are people out there who care um, basically whatever you do in your classrooms make your lessons so engaging that they won't want to miss out because when that level of energy and excitement and um, enthusiasm is there in your classroom, that's when the magic happens. That's when the, the kids are there and learning and wanting to share and engage. And it's just brilliant when it just flows like that. Um, and this is what I'm always saying to all my teachers I work with and the kids, 
you've just got to start somewhere. So starting somewhere and starting small is better than not starting at all. And often when teachers are implementing a new CLIL unit, for instance, on whatever topic, whatever subject, whatever language, it's really daunting, but you've just got to start somewhere. And same with all of these emotional um, lessons that I've just quickly whipped through um, and activities. Just, just start with something and make those small changes to your teaching practice. You know, the high five as they walk in or the, you know, leaving a little note occasionally for a child or a student say, hey, I really appreciate what you did. Um, great job today. You, you just don't know. The smallest, the smallest start um, is better than nothing. Um, I, just, I hope you can all take that on board and just remember that if nothing else from this really, um, really fast presentation. Um, just a bit of information about what I do, um, where I am and where I can be found on my socials and yeah, this is, leads me to this time and I think I've made it through. Yes, I have. So time for any questions or any discussion. I'll click through onto the chat thing now. Hang on. Um, where's my mouse? Okay. Okay. All right. Can you still hear me? Okay. Did anyone have any questions? I've just got onto the chat now and I'm just whipping through it, what everyone has said. Um, okay. Yeah. Sorry, I just like talking. I'm going to say something here. Uh, so, the one thing I think that I saw that was the, the biggest, uh, uh, I think, risk uh, was when you came into the classroom and all the desks were arranging rows and lines and facing forward. Um, I've had that, that challenge too when kids are used to that. And for years before I work with them in the classroom, all the classroom teacher, uh, they will be used to sitting in rows and the other teachers used to sitting in rows and visitors to the classroom are used to them sitting in rows. What I had the opportunity to do was to set up a far more cooperative classroom, whereas when there used to be as you had there when you arranged it, the four desks for four kids, I took mm. two desks away. And so it became four kids for two desks. And that yeah. process I found even more valuable for the learners. And you think, okay, well, there's not space. But if you have those single desks between two students, there's enough space for two A4 sized daughters to fit in there. So your big, your big science daughters or your big writing daughters will fit end to end there without getting in the way. My question though is, is mm. beyond that for you, how do you encourage that um, uh, mentality of closeness, of community, so that for next year these learners aren't then put back into the, the row system and so that they can really voice, as you're a language teacher, they can voice their, their love or the, their, their feelings of respect when they were in a situation when they were safe and secure because there was four of them. And in that group of four, they felt, I can do what I want because I know that you guys are, are not going to black. You guys are going to support. You guys are going to talk back with me. And we'll have this relationship for a while. How do you have, or how do you spread to other teachers so that when they come to the next class or they come to the next uh, specialist, that they can share? Or they can they can say, but but I don't like seeing like this anymore. How, what would you? I would. Um, well, in that particular classroom, I was a visiting teacher, so I was in and out of many classrooms. Um, so it was really quick. So I'd go in and I'd talk to the teacher. I'd say, okay, I'm going to move the tables around, and the teacher would sort of go, oh, okay, I'm not really comfortable. She didn't, he or she didn't say this, but oh, okay. And the kids would sort of look at the teacher, and the teacher would go, well, just do what she says, you know. And so that was all a bit of a shock for all of them in that classroom. I'm referring to now. And sometimes I would leave a classroom and I could literally hear the tables being moved back as yeah. soon as I left through the door. Um, 
I suppose what I would do to overcome that or try and change the mentality, I suppose, of the teacher, is that what you're referring to, and the, and the students, is, is to ask them, okay, have an open and honest conversation. Do you like learning? What do you like? What do you like or dislike about learning in this way? What can we do? And to really have um, give them the ownership and the teachers the ownership to try and come to some sort of agreement where both parties are feeling that they've had their um, voices heard for you know some sort of negotiation. It might be that part of the time we have the furniture like this and part of the time we have it like this and just have that open channel for everyone to have their voices and their opinions expressed. Did it work for this class or for the class? Of course that has a, a, a approach been successful? Um, yeah, because the teachers and the students have, have been given the opportunity to explain. I mean, I'm I, I do like to see the world through rose-coloured glasses, but I am aware that there are a lot of um, people out there, not just teachers, there's a lot of people out there who don't like change. And all I can do is just make suggestions and give them the, the evidence, I suppose, and the evidence in this case being that the students are happy to learn like that. Um, but that was just one, That those photos was just from one classroom. I mean, change takes time and it's all about how you suggest that the change occur. You're, you're, you're saying change and that's really uh, uh, something that again we can't escape as educators ever and systems can't escape change either unless they just stagnate and then they, they, they will die. But I think that what, what in Scotland where I'm teaching a bigger thing than resisting change is relinquishing power and what mm -hmm. I see a lot of teachers here in Scotland have is they want to confront of the room they want to be answering all the questions. They want to be directing all the talk. And it's mm. that, which I think is even perhaps a bigger one that, 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 that encouraging change is to say, okay, let go. They're yeah. learning. Yeah, I know, yeah. I know you're, you're, you're maybe smarter than them, I know more than them, but give them a chance to teach you. Yeah, exactly. And you've just touched on something which I haven't included in this particular presentation, but, um, I, I see it as, as a ladder. Lots of students, sorry, lots of teachers perceive themselves as being up here and their kids down here. Well, it, it, flip it sideways and work together and work, climb along the rung together and meet in the middle. And therefore, both of you, all of you are learning um, together. And it's only a benefit for, for everyone involved. I don't, I really don't like and you know I can only do so much but um, I, I understand exactly what you're saying that the teachers up here you know you you will sit down you will do this you will turn to page 10 and do this no discussion allowed and oh my god it just makes my head explode and my heart just aches to see those kids so so yeah when I went into those classrooms that was my visit um, last year and, and those teachers really didn't want me to move the, the tables around or change the room at all, but I still did it because I was in a position where I could get away with it just to, you know, oh, well, let's just see what, how it goes and we'll just see what the kids think and, um, yeah, we'll just, we'll just give it a go. And, and then they saw it, but they, they couldn't admit it, but they, they saw it working, um, but not all the time. It doesn't work all the time, trust me. I think my biggest upset in teaching with regard to this was uh, I taught a year at primary three in Scotland and this is yep. a fabulous group of really lovely children who were very very positive and after taking the, the, the course of learning with an older class uh, the year before I introduced again the system of having one rectangular desk for four kids. The side of the room was their resources like their pens and pencils and pencil cases and such and at their desk, they had only a pencil and rubber at the cup. And that was all that they had. And when daughters came out, daughters came out. And they had, again, that close relationship. Halfway through that year, a company called Sundog recruited me to work full time. And so I left. And mm. within the space of two weeks, the teachers who came in to replace me had rearranged the whole desk system to make the kids twice as far away from each other with all the resources in the desk again making for clutter, making for noise, making for, I can't find by this. I thought, because I came back to visit the school and uh, as, as part of the job I did, we visited the schools and showed the, the sun dog. And it was just so sad to see they're not talking anymore, they're quiet mm -hmm. now, 
they're keeping themselves or raising their hand. I mean, I, I, it's kind of nice to have the whole raising hand, which is a respect thing, I guess, but not as mm. a control thing. Not to prevent kids from contributing to the discussion as we would in any environment. We don't, when we're talking with someone, hey, can I talk now? No, no, it's, just, yeah. it's a fluid thing. And it was sad because now, because the desks, the screens are twice as far from each other, when they did talk, it was all, shh, be quieter, be quieter. Whereas before, yeah. you didn't have to have that. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, the whole notion of we must teach in a quiet classroom where no students are talking. Well, why? Because how can they practice their, their additional language if they can't talk it? Often, you know, the parents at home or families at home aren't learning the same language that these kids are learning at school. So where else are they going to practice it? But at school with their peers. So I don't know. I'm, I'm too determined and I believe in this too much um, not to continue pushing forward with those ideas, but it's, it is a battle. Trust me, I, I do um, come across my brick walls from time to time. <laughs> I, get invited to, I get invited to public schools classrooms by some of the colleagues. They know I do communication skills trainings with students and teachers. And uh, I must say, the key obstacle is the teachers are just intimidated by the unplanned questions they might receive. And they're too embarrassed to say that they just don't have the answer, let's go and find it, for, let's find it together. And I, I, I don't know how they, how they will overcome this, but uh, until they do, I don't think that they're really capable of teaching children to be independent thinkers, to be allowed to, fail move forward and just you know learn out of the mistake it's 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 very much still a theory that uh, they tell the kids don't be embarrassed to fail although you will get graded when you fail you won't get instructed how to avoid it in the next step uh, <clears throat> uh, my my daughter's uh, class master she invited me to uh, train kids into uh, and group work so we did, we did uh, camp and she was the one who was the shyest person in the classroom, just standing like this in the corner of home classroom, completely terrified of what's going on. And it's a loud class otherwise, but I had 25 kids working together. They decided amongst themselves who the mother is, who's the one taking care of the discipline within the group. Who's the one taking notes? So, but I talked to them in advance uh, how to recognize the leader, the note taker, the visionary, the analyst in the group. You have to give them five key questions and then let them go with it. Uh, she was, she, yeah. And I mean, the, and the first thing I did, because they're really a loud class. My, my daughter hates her own class. That's how loud they are. Uh, they undermine each other's presentations very often, which is a terrible thing they're doing to one another. But what I did is I, uh, I they, they already, they, when they were entering the classroom, they just wanted to throw their bags, their, their backpacks on the tables. They were so surprised with the music, they started doing this, entering the classroom like this. So I kind of rearranged their idea about the whole class at the door and then I switched to slow jazzy music which just calmed them down and yeah. let me have my intro so the music does wonders wonders God. for them and, yeah, I, and, I, and not being afraid yeah yeah I, I often have meditation music in I should have mentioned that before um, when I'm completing some of these activities because it just it just calms them, particularly after a heated argument at lunchtime, which often is the case. Um, you know, to come inside and just have calming music playing and then just, okay, everyone, we're just going to sit down and do this activity for you. I'm not marking it. It is not an assessment task. This is not for any exam. This is just something for you. And they're not used to it. They're not used to being given time to do something for themselves, which is ironic scenes where we're in the world of education and teaching children to do things for them but really I'm aware of these overcrowded curriculums um, and th th it's just about being creative with how you incorporate these activities into your own classes there's there are so many ways and so many ideas and I am very aware that I've gone through all of those activities very quickly 
Um, <coughs> but I have, I have so many tips that you can just, just do. And the benefits are amazing. You know, you're teaching kids hearts and it's beautiful. <laughs> so, yeah. I'm just catching up on the chats here. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry I didn't um, get that link working. Never mind. I'll, I'll send it through so you can have a look at that Jack Ma snippet from his YouTube. It was, it was really, um, really good. Anyway, I think, I think that was all, unless anyone had any other questions or discussion points. Thank you so much for this, Tilka. I'm so happy we got you. Oh, thank we you. Global. you. Wonderful, I was talking wonderful so I'm sorry, I'm not used to talking to a screen. It's bizarre. Oh, <laughs> I know, but <laughs> we're teachers. We never stop talking. No, we don't. No. <laughs> it was so lovely to meet you all. Thank you so much. And who knows, maybe I'll come to visit your schools one day. And yet, keep looking for the hearts. They're everywhere. Yes. They're everywhere. <laughs> All I'm, right. I'm gonna, I'm